Hi guys, today we're going to go chat with Aman Advani, one of the co-founders of Ministry of Supply. And Ministry of Supply, uh, they make some really cool men's fashion wear. And they are reinventing the professional wardrobe, adding technology into clothing. Uh, they've had two very successful Kickstarters in the past, one for their Apollo shirt uh, and another for their dress socks. Uh, so let's go chat with Aman together and when we met and had kind of a loose business plan built but decided once we met each other we had complementary skill sets and we wanted to go forward with this idea of um, building a men's wardrobe that really knocked out the barriers of today's wardrobe uh, by leveraging technology by, by using our engineering background. So we launched the product on Kickstarter uh, in June of 2012 to, to some great success that we were really proud of. Cool. We'll definitely get to the Kickstarter. Just before we do that, like talk to me about was this something that was your own problem? Was this a deep passion of yours? Was this a, a side thing that was kind of, you know, nights and weekends? Or, or did you know, you know, I want to fix business apparel. This is something that bothers me day in and day out. Yeah. You know, how, how much did you know this was your thing before your Kickstarter? Before getting there. Yeah, so, you know, I'll speak to my story specifically, and then we could also, you know, you'd have a good time talking to Gihan and Kit about their stories, too, because they're equally entertaining. Uh, my favorite part is coming at this from a customer's angle that uh, I was in consulting for about uh, three and a half years before coming back to business school. Mm -hmm. uh, and every every Monday, for I think I, at one point I had like a 60 week straight going, uh, Monday morning getting on a plane and going out to some client site yeah. and Thursday afternoon coming back. And, you know, there's some part of me that enjoyed it, of course. But let's just pick a Monday. By the time you get back to your hotel at 9 p.m. that night, you've been out for 14 or 15 hours. And so I'd peel these. Party. Yeah, yeah, Party. yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just about it. And we would like, you. it's going to sound terrible and probably way too much information, but you'd peel these, you know, dress socks off that were kind of damp from 14 hours of you walking around in leather stiff shoes. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know it's equally bad for women. We, we only do menswear, but just speaking from a customer's angle, God, I couldn't wait to get my, my gym shorts on. And then, then the real work would start, you know, 10 o'clock, I'd have my laptop back up. So... I used to cut out the dry fit um, beds of my Nike socks and sew those into those really crappy gold toe socks. And I'd wear those to work and kind of nerd out with my friends about it. And of so course, you were hacking yeah. your own clothes together. Yeah, and so yeah. it was just kind of fun because I enjoyed you know, not being as uncomfortable. They were distinctly better even though they were just hacked together. Yeah. Um, so I started kind of taking that concept and saying, how could you build out an entire underlayer so that I could look great, but I could feel you know, secretly incredible is one, one word we used to use a lot. Was, how can I always have an edge up on everyone around me without them having to necessarily know it? Mm. Um, and since the product line has, has evolved, obviously, to being outer and inner, so for instance, the shirt I'm wearing is a prototype of one we might come out with later this fall upon a few tweaks, but, you know, it should be classically styled, so you shouldn't know that I'm necessarily wearing something crazy, but there's micro perforations under the arms here, or, you know, the thermally laminated collar or has stretch to it, that how can we combine this powerful function into something that has to look and, and meet a classic aesthetic. Cool. Awesome. So yeah, let's get into the chaos, the Kickstarter. So you guys uh, have launched two successful Kickstarters, um, which is super interesting because I'm sure you took lessons away from the first uh, and into the second. So in July of 2012, you guys crushed it uh, with the Apollo shirt, uh, raised $430,000 and you were asking for 30 k and then the next summer in July 2013, you raised over 200K with the sock that you were just mentioning. Uh, also, you only asked for 30K. Um, so just let's go back to the very first Kickstarter. Before you knew anything, before you guys knew this thing was going to really take off, uh, what was your thinking and strategy going into it in terms of how you were going to attract people to go to your Kickstarter and actually give you money? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think, to be honest, I don't know that we had one. Uh, I think most new Kickstarters, and very much uh, we were part of this conversation, kind of assume that there's some natural organic uh, momentum that'll happen. If you just will it for the first 20, uh, 24 hours, you can get to your friends and family to bid on it. The, the next 29 days, or in our case, we did the 33-day campaign. The next 32 days would just kind of take care of themselves. Uh, so to say that we had some massive strategy upon conception of going to Kickstarter, no, but through the next three or four months before we actually launched, we certainly developed a plan. Oh, um, so okay, so you did have a plan in the three or four months prior to going into your Kickstarter. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so yeah. how did you guys, let's talk about press for a minute, because that's, you know, what our blog is all about, is how, how do people go into Kickstarter and uh, make sure that they're going to get the press that they need 
to raise money that they need. How did you guys think about uh, pitching your story? How did you find the contacts that yeah. you wanted to pitch? Let's talk through the kind of nitty gritty of that. We yeah we, we went a few different angles with press because we can I mean you know for us and, and for most Kickstarter campaigns the story is everything right that people connecting with the story is so important and the story is best told not by you but by someone else and that's what press is is someone else telling your story in a more genuine or, or sincere fashion than, mm -hmm. than than you're conceived to be um, so you know there's a couple different outlets that we looked at so blogs or smaller publications and and then some larger publications and. Clearly, you don't have the ability to just email TechCrunch and say, hey, this is going to be big. So you, you swallow your ego for a second and you, you go find the people that are actually you know, interested in your story just on the idea itself. And so we emailed about 150 blogs that were even mildly relevant to our content, whether it was fashion. I think we emailed some about, you know, we have this NASA technology in our shirts. So we would email aeronautics blogs to see if they'd be interested. And we basically write them a custom letter every time that said, hey, look at this post from a month ago. Um, that you wrote. No, that, that they had just on their blog. Right, like this, this, them, that they wrote. That they wrote, yeah. So look at this post on your blog, it did really well, and I think that you know if you featured our Kickstarter project, right. the same people that love that, if that did well, they'll love our project too. And awesome. Yes, I think that yielded like three or four blogs, which fine, that's fantastic. It sounds like a low conversion. At the same time, we had two different news outlets uh, lined up to do, and local news outlets, I should say, lined up to cover this story of you know, these MIT kids getting into fashion. That was kind of a one-liner that was enough to say, maybe there's something interesting here. And so we had a couple of news outlets that were ready. The second week, like, to launch on our on our uh, Kickstarter campaign, they were ready to put the, the story live. I think cool. the lesson learned there was that you shouldn't give an exclusive to two different companies. <laughs> they weren't... They won't be thrilled with that. Yeah, they weren't too happy about that, but it worked out okay and everything. Yeah. So cool. I'm hearing a couple lessons there, actually. One is that you guys custom wrote a shit ton of emails, 150 yeah. different emails. Yeah. Um, two, you made sure to connect them to the content of the people who have written prior. You said, hey, you wrote this other thing before. We're kind of like that too. Maybe you want to write about us. Uh, three, you didn't actually go after the big guys, the tech crunches of the world straight away. You said, let's go for the smaller guys. Um, that's what you did the first time around. Let's talk about the second time around. You know, how did that... Did you follow the exact same strategy? Did you say, hey, that worked super well the first time? Yeah. Um, what did you do the second time that was different? Yeah, you know, I, honestly, I think that would we'll give you a pretty poor answer, but I think, yeah, honestly, the same thing. I think there's one thing that we added or layered into that was to say that, you know, we didn't expect this story to take off like it did the first time. We got some incredible coverage on our first campaign. We, we really didn't see it coming, but every one of them used the same three words, MIT meets fashion. And it was so easy for that sound bite to be carried over and over. Yeah. And the second you hear that, you're interested or you want to learn more. So if there's anything we did the second time, it was being more intentional about what those three-word phrases are. So coffee with socks, mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily just three words, but this idea that, that, that we would provide the story. Or, you know, we started off with pressure mapping for your socks, let's say, or yeah. uh, you know, moisture-wicking dress socks or something like that. Or, you know, and it ended up that coffee, you know, coffee-embedded socks was the one that caught people's attention and said, wait, you have coffee in your socks. I, right. I don't get it. I'm like, as you're yeah. saying that, I'm like, that's crazy. You're drinking coffee. Yeah. You're drinking the whole vibe. Right. Um, so that's the one that took off and that, that people were excited to hear. And so yeah. that's why we focused more on that. So we provided the story, I say, if anything changed. Cool. Um, and I think another kind of subtle point there is that you actually learned what was working and you did more of it. And that's something that we... Uh, talk to clients about all the time is this idea of like learn what's working and lean heavy on yeah. that or so, what's not working exactly so I think the pressure mapping socks wasn't getting anybody that were what is pressure map socks I don't get what that means and so yeah. halfway through, maybe a third of the way through the campaign we switched everything our cover image was a, a pair of socks draped in coffee beans our, our cool. you know, the video yeah. was coffee 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 the copy was what does coffee and socks have to do with you guys went all in you said we found the message that's yeah. working change everything yeah and what did you how did you know it was working versus not working? Like what, what data or information or was it a gut feeling? Like how did you say this coffee bean thing is working, this pressure mapping thing yeah. is not working? You know, I, I don't know if this is helpful at all, but I think what we did is, is you know, word of mouth is, a, a, in our opinion, just the, the smallest version of PR, where if you tell somebody everything that is great about our dress socks and you listen to what they tell somebody else with 100% uh, every single time that it was the coffee line, right? We could have told them this great story about how we spent 
hours doing you know strain analysis to see how your foot actually stretches. We did pressure mapping to see where you put your you know your foot down. We did heat mapping to see where you expel the heat off the feet. Oh, and we embed toasted coffee beans, uh, toasted coffee grinds within the fiber, uh, and then blend that polyester with cotton. And and then two seconds later, they turn around and tell their friend. Check out these coffee socks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it's the same way that any news article is going to say. I'm going to hear that whole story, and the one that jumped out to me was the fact that you have toasted coffee grinds. Right. So you basically looked and said, "How are other people repeating our story?" Yeah. And if they're using the words coffee beans and coffee socks and not pressure mapping, like that's telling you something. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Um, so talk to me. One thing I found really interesting: you guys crushed it on the first campaign, and you asked for 30k. You come back around on the second campaign a year later. You still ask for the exact same amount, yeah. Um, and that's a question we hear a lot of the time from people running Kickstarters. They say, "How much money should I ask for? I don't want to ask for so little that it looks ridiculous, but I also want to make sure I get the money I sure. ask for." Because on Kickstarter, if you don't get uh, all of it, you get none of it. Sure. So, what was your thinking around uh, asking for thirty k versus saying, "You know what? Like, let's blow this out of the water. Let's ask for two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really good question, uh, something that we struggle with a lot, and I'd be lying if I said there was more art to it, or more science to it than art, where yeah. the reality is that it's exactly what you just said, it's it's don't want to pick a low enough number that it, it gives the perception, if you had a thousand dollars, there would be this perception that these are cheap or shitty socks, Right. but if you pick a number like 250,000, it's almost like, hey, look at these guys, they're so arrogant, they can think raise a quarter million, I'm not, I'm not going to waste my time, they're never going to get there. Yeah. Uh, but picking a number like 30,000 has a lot of different purposes. One, it actually aligns pretty well to the production run we did that costs almost exactly 30,000. Uh, two, and, and probably most importantly, it was a, a big enough number, it was the right size number that would prove that the demand actually existed. So mm-hmm. unlike our first campaign, we had not produced a true batch of socks, even a test batch. When this one came out, so we we didn't you know we knew these socks were great. Know how much it would cost. Right, so yeah. we knew they were great. We had the, we had the costings down pretty well, which is a lesson learned from the first time. We had to have the costings down, um, but we didn't necessarily know what the market take up. We had final prototypes. We were ready to go, and we could you know pull the trigger the second we needed to. But mm-hmm. the thirty thousand dollar line to us you know just happened to match the first one. But more importantly, was to say thirty thousand dollars worth of socks for us. That volume or that quantity of socks, if we can sell that much. That means there's true demand out there, and that yeah. means that people actually want this. So it's more validation of demand than a certain hardcore line on production. That makes a ton of sense to me, and that that I mean, I think you don't give you got you know maybe being humble, but it wasn't a number pulled out of thin air, right? You were saying it's actually based on the cost of manufacturing the stock and and knowing that there's real demand there. So it wasn't uh, just a you know let's put ten different numbers in the hat and pull one out. Right, right, right. Well, you, there's a lot of different factors that yeah. go into it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so talk to me about, uh, what were some of the most surprising things that you saw over either the first or second campaign, uh, from a PR perspective? Was it, you know, one particular blog or article that you never thought would convert actually drove a ton of backers? Was it, you know, how easy it was to get press, how hard it was to get press? What what was the most surprising thing? No, I think that's a great question. There's two two different things that, that I caught on that you said that, that came true, or, or one in particular. One is we were shocked at some of the blogs that actually did well for us. So we were in this blog called Soldier Systems, which is a very tactical gear focused blog. Yeah, you told me the story, and I love this story. It. I was yeah, pulling this out of you. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was shocking because it was like, I think it ended up giving us more actual purchases, not necessarily more views, but more purchases than our TechCrunch article, which is crazy. Yeah. That this tactical blog that had no idea even existed, you know, had such a great following. And when you say tactical, um, you mean it's about weapons. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. And, and it's just, just a blog that typically features guns. Right. And it yeah. just kind of caught us off guard and said, okay, well, uh, maybe we should focus more on that because yeah. that was the, where the actual sales were coming. I think the second thing, and it's not to say we didn't mind that we loved the TechCrunch article, it was great coverage, and they had a, a positive light on us too. The second thing I think we learned was uh, the momentum and how that works. So you start off with a couple of smaller publications that were fantastic and very reputable. Uh, um, magazines in that case, but they built one upon another. So it was just as as the campaign went on, as the, the traction built, the momentum built, that the you know the 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 snowball grew, um, yeah. and the, the tech crunches came, you know, twenty and twenty five days I think into the campaign before we got that level of coverage. Hmm. But by then we had already proved some great traction. We had already been in a number of different publications that kind of acknowledged that we weren't you know messing around that we were for right. real. So it was just. Right. 
I, I think if, we, if we'd started with TechCrunch, no one would have listened to us, but TechCrunch eventually kind of caught on. I think, in fact, they contacted us because of the momentum we were able to build. So that's super interesting. That, uh, two big lessons just to distill that out. One is you don't know who's going to be in your work on blog. Like, who's going to be the blog that you didn't think would yeah, matter to, yeah. but it converts like crazy Yeah. Um, in terms of converts to backers. And then two is... It might not be the best idea to go after the tech crunches of the world from day one. You know, sometimes they need a little bit of validation that your your campaign is actually has legs on its own. Yeah. And sometimes it's actually going to be easier. They'll come to you like yep. they did in your case. Uh, you don't even have to pitch them because the product and the success speaks for itself. That's yeah. That's awesome. And, and, and the only thing I'd add on to that is that there is some logic to why Stereoshoe worked. Not Stereoshoe. Stereoshoe is actually one that worked really well recently. Very similar concept that was meant for, I think, people with athletes, but uh, something similar to that. But a great, yeah. a great blog that happened to feature our socks and drove a ton of traffic, or this guy, Max the Cyclist. But the one thing they all have is that they're not hardcore fashion blogs, right. and they're adjacent to the space we're working in. So whether it's Max the Cyclist, who features a lot of travel gear, we're not travel gear, but we're very travel friendly. Yeah. So pitching to a travel blog is great because they can acknowledge that hey, you get the best of looking professional, but also traveling. So yeah. it wasn't our you know main seam of fashion, but it was all these adjacent markets. So it ended up cool. being the, the real sellers. Cool. And to me, that distills down to think of the use cases of a product, yeah. right? Like think how people are going to really use this, and then back into which blogs it might be relevant to. That's awesome. Um, kind of to wrap things up, is there any advice? You know, that you typically give to people when they come to you and they say, hey, I'm on, I'm about to do a Kickstarter, no yeah. idea what I'm supposed to worry about, like, where do I even start? Yeah. Uh, what are some of the, you know, from a PR perspective, uh, what are some of those things that you typically give as advice or that you want to give to our audience out, uh, out there? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. I, you know, I think the only thing that comes to mind is to know your product so well and to have it down. And the reason I say this is not just about PR. I think when you talk about PR, it's great to have the credibility of this being something that you're really excited about, really passionate about, really understand what stories exist and what stories people are excited about. But equally importantly, when you're actually executing the campaign, knowing your product means knowing your costs. We actually you know, didn't make out particularly well on that first campaign, even mm -hmm. though it looks like we probably made a kill and we, we, we right. didn't. Uh, but also we delivered a couple of weeks, you know, eight or 10 weeks late on that first campaign because we didn't understand our, you know, our scaled supply chain. So there are so many different implications of knowing your product front to back and focusing first on the product and then on the marketing, branding and PR where right. it all starts with a really cohesive product. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks, Iman. Yeah, thanks this for was awesome. Me. We'll be back next time.